Wake that ass up early in the morning. The Breakfast Club. Morning, everybody. It's DJ NV Angela Yee, Charlemagne the Guy. We are The Breakfast Club. We got a special guest on the line. We had to hold up the interview for a second because uh, it was almost a huge problem. We have Sister Soldier on the line. Good morning. <laughs> Good morning and peace to the globe. Peace, now, the problem Sister was Char- she could only see Charlemagne. And we didn't want to have 40 minutes of you just looking at his ugly ass. So First of all, we had God, to fix God it. doesn't make anything ugly. Okay? <laughs> all right. Okay, that's between y'all, that sounds like. <laughs> you see him? That's, that's personal. Well, welcome, yeah, Sister Soldier. Peace. And thank you for welcoming me to the Breakfast Club. I really appreciate it. How are you? I'm pretty good. I, um... I have uh, posted on my Instagram for the first time since I think maybe, I mean, for the first time probably ever. Wow. <laughs> I've been having what I call a moment of silence. The last book that I wrote was called A Moment of Silence, Midnight Three. And in the opening poem, I thought that I wrote that I thought that everybody needed more than a moment of silence, maybe even a whole year to self-reflect and to self-correct because of the direction that, you know, things seem to be moving in, not just for myself, but, you know, for the whole country. Yeah, I wonder about people like you who are so brilliant, you know, when they when they write and it's like when the pandemic happened and everybody was at home. Did you triple down on writing? I know you was already, you know, in in writing mode. Did you write even more? No, I just thought it was really interesting because all of a sudden everybody had to live like me. (laughs) (laughs) You know, when when people were upset about quarantining, but my life is like that anyway. I mean, I do normal everyday things. I go to the market, I shop, I cook, I do the laundry. I do normal everyday things. But in terms of writing, or trying to be a, a, a meaningful author. You spend most of your time researching, reading, uh, interviewing, things like that. So uh, I'd always be either indoors or in bookstores <laughs> or in meetings, interviewing people anyway. So when the quarantine came, it was an easy shift for me to make. Mm-hmm. So you're pretty much a homebody anyway, pretty much. Not a homebody because I travel the world. So even when I'm saying I'm indoors, I'm in my hotel, mm-hmm. wherever I'm at at the moment. Got you. Now, how did you do research? Of course, you know, The Coldest Winter Ever to me is like, and to a lot of people, is a classic book. It's like Shakespeare level when it comes to writing and all of that. And for a lot of people, even when did that come out? In 1999? Yeah, Shakespeare. Even yeah. today. Shakespeare are, not as good as Sister Soldier. Oh, well, thank you. (laughs) But even today, people are still like discovering it, the younger generation for the first time. And for some people that is like, you know, 14 years old reading about winter. So for yourself, right, how did you research a character like that? And then even for the new novel that you have, how did you do research for her character? Well, for the coldest winter ever, I didn't have to do research. I mean, the bottom line is... uh, you either grew up in the hood or you didn't. <laughs> and uh, for the first part of my life, I grew up in the Bronx. Uh, first, I was on Crows Avenue in a house and my parents divorced and uh, I was in the projects in Throg's Neck. So uh, you see so many things when you're living there. Uh, if you're the type of person who's observant, uh, and that's how I am, kind of observant and very quiet, uh, although people may not believe that, and uh, study a lot. And so uh, when I went to write The Coldest Winter Ever, I wanted to write a cautionary tale against drugs, because when I was growing up in the Bronx, you know, it was the heroin epidemic, and the drugs hit the hood so hard. And I was a child, I was very fearful of it. So when I became an adult, I said, let me write uh, a novel uh, that gives people caution about the whole drug death style. And uh, and then when I said that to myself, I said, well, you don't know any big hustlers and, you know, you don't know that life. So how can you write about it? And what do you know about? And this is me talking to myself. And I said, well, I know about women. I said, I know what I'll do. I'll write about the hustler's daughter. Mm. And she's going to be cold. She's going to be cold-blooded. 
And then I said, oh, cold blooded. I'm gonna name her Winter. And then I said, well, she gotta be in love with somebody because you know, when we're teenagers, normally uh, us women, we have some guy that we're fixated on. And uh, I said, he's gonna be tall, dark, handsome. And I was like, dog, dog, dog. Then I said, midnight. I said, that's it. I'm gonna name her Winter. I'm gonna name him Midnight. And I'm gonna name the book, The Coldest Winter. Wow. And then my, then my husband said, no, the coldest winter ever. And that was it. Wow. Well, how we get here? Tw- why, and why 20 years later, the sequel, The Coldest Winter Ever, Life After Death, what took so long? Oh, because like I said, it was a cautionary tale. And um, at the end of Coldest Winter Ever, uh, I don't want to be a plot a spoiler for people who haven't read it, but millions of people have read it already. So I guess it's okay to say at the end of Coldest Winter Ever, uh, went to get sentenced mm-hmm. to 15 years. I, I didn't want to come out with a book a year later about winter. I wanted the community to feel what it feels like when somebody you love, mm-hmm. whose presence you you enjoy, actually gets incarcerated. They get removed from your social and cultural existence. I thought it was important that if it was going to be a genuine, uh, you know, a genuine uh, cautionary tale, I thought it was very important for the whole hood to feel the absence of Winter Santiago. And I thought it would be really big when Winter Santiago got released 15 years later. She's doing a mandatory minimum. And if you know anything about that, there's no negotiation room or good time for that Mm -hmm. Uh, good time served. You don't get out early. You have to do each of the 15 years. So I kind of let it reverberate while I wrote other books on other characters that are midnight. Yes. Midnight. (laughs) Now I want to ask you this because it's called life after death. Mm -hmm. And immediately we had no idea when I heard you were writing the sequel, I was like, okay, where is she going to take this? What's going to happen? When did it spark in your head? I'm not, I'm not, but I'm just going to say, when did it spark in your head? This is what I want to do. Like, when did that happen? Was it years ago? Like how long or was it right after the story? Yeah. Okay. Um, Well, it's like this. Um, I knew that the coldest winter ever so many people read it around the world and so many other writers did their own version of my book. Mm-hmm. And I'm not saying nothing because I, well, for 20 years, I didn't really mention it. So whatever. <laughs> so I said, I don't want to come back with a sequel, sequel that's a copy of a copy of mm-hmm. my book, The Coldest Winter Ever. I want to come back with something that is completely unique. And so that's when I just went into my imagination and uh, I thought of the story of life after death. And I wrote it in such a way, I said, I'm gonna write this in such a way at the top of my excellence, but I'm gonna make sure this is something that no author ever wrote before. And that's Mm -hmm. the story. Did did you feel any pressure since Coldest Winter ever was such a you know, a, 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 a staple in black literature and it was so big and massive. Did you feel any pressure with the sequel? No, I'm, I'm, a, I'm, I'm a cool vibration, meaning that I don't really get pressed by, you know, the readers or the public or anything. Everything that I do, I'm doing for a purpose or I'm doing it for a reason. I want it to be meaningful. And uh, if I was the kind of author that did what the readers expected or what the public expected, then that would lessen my value. Because if you can anticipate or expect what I'm what I'm going to write, then you could have wrote it yourself. What's supposed to make me special as an author is I'm writing something so dynamic you couldn't have thought of it yourself, or at least you didn't up until <laughs> the moment of the release. I want to talk about Midnight's character from not from this book, but previously and his interracial relationship. What are your thoughts on interracial relationships and not even just interracial, but just huge cultural differences, you know, from 
uh, who midnight is and then him marrying somebody who is Japanese and family things and all of that. What are your thoughts on it? Because I know so many people have things to say nowadays about the relationships between especially African-American and Asian people. Well, to be honest with you, uh, I think it's all about the soul. I think the reason why it's an issue for African-American women and men is a political reason, but it's a different reason than emotion, love, and soul. The political reason is because I think as African-American people, we have felt all the time, especially women, that there are not enough men, uh, that so many of our men are incarcerated. Uh, or under court supervision or having economic difficulties. So we have felt that there's not enough men. And uh, so we get angry when somebody from another community marries one of our men. And then also, I think to keep it real, as African-American women, we wonder sometimes, do our men love us? Do they think that we are beautiful. Do they love us if we have the same complexion that they do? You know, if we're dark brown, if we're black skin, do they love us? Or is it automatically that they want to find somebody based on them being of a lighter complexion or a whiter complexion? So now I have to answer this question like I have matured and learned and traveled around the world. And I'm wiser than I was when I was younger. You know, hopefully, inshallah, I'm wiser than I was before. So I still now, now I think it's about the soul, two people to come in together for the soul. And it's about the belief, the faith. Do they believe in the same things? Can they make a family that has love and harmony, that's balanced, you know, uh, that raises the children well? I think those are the dominant issues. I know for a fact, when you come from the United States of America, like I do, and all of you do, you're obsessed with race. You're obsessed with it because race moves so many of the dimensions of America the economic dimension, the political dimension, the cultural dimension, uh, race moves even uh, whether or not you're safe, whether or not you receive equal protection under the law, whether or not the United States Constitution applies to you. All of these things impact our community so uh, intensely that I think uh, it makes us obsessed with race. What gives mm. you your inspiration? To continue to go on like where do you what what inspires you since you inspire so many people you know i just want to be good i think being evil is so easy and it's so common you know and it's, it's kind of like a thing everybody does it uh i want to be good i want uh my soul to be good i care about what happens to my soul after it returns, meaning after I pass away from this earth. I don't believe it's the end of life once you, you leave the earth. I believe your soul lives on and so, and that there's judgment. I know we live in a time where the young people don't wanna believe in judgment or they hate judges That's right. and they hate judgment. My thing is I'm not the judge but there is a judge. And so since I know that there is a judge for my own soul, and I'm only responsible for my own soul, for my own soul, I want to do the right thing so I can end up in the right place when my soul leaves the earth. That, you know, that's that's one of the reasons what you just said about, um, you know, people not wanting to be judged. That's one of the reasons I've always loved Cold as Winter Ever because there was a real consequence to win his, to win his mm. actions. You know what I mean? Because a lot of times you see these stories and there's no real consequences and repercussions. And I, I've seen that trickle into real life now. These kids really don't think there's no consequences or repercussions to their actions. I think the discussions that we have, a lot of times uh, we don't have a common link with scholarship, you know? People who have studied, not for the sake of being arrogant or being superior to the hood, but for the sake of helping 
For example, we had this whole big dialogue going about snitching and, you know, uh, about, you know, whether somebody is a rat or a human, mm -hmm. you know, a civilian or, you know, mm -hmm. all of this big dialogue. And when I'm seeing this dialogue, I'm saying, wow, you know, in science class when I was young, they taught me that self-preservation is the first law of nature. Mm -hmm. Self-preservation is the first law of nature. That means if somebody's back is up against the wall, their natural inclination will be to save themselves. Mm -hmm. Now, I'm not saying this to say, oh, I support snitching. I'm saying this to say that if you study and you learn some things, you won't all the time be shocked That's right. by what people do and how people do what they do. There's an old saying, there's no honor among thieves. Right. So how come when there's a ring of thieves or a ring of crime, people expect there to be honor? Why would <laughs> there be honor? There's no honor among thieves. That's right. Gotcha. Can, can you blame people for what they're, what, they're, what they're doing when they're just trying to survive? Uh, it's not about blame. I think what it is is that uh, we all have been given a mind and a soul. And your mind either manufactures good options that lead to good outcomes, or it does not. But your mind, you know, is, is, is like a car. If you don't put gas in the car, the car won't move. Mm. If you don't put knowledge into your mind, your mind won't manufacture good options and you won't know how to grab onto positive opportunities. <coughs> so you think, I don't have something, so I might as well steal it. Mm. And then you feel justified. You feel justified stealing it because you're like, well, look, I didn't have it, so I stole it. What's the big deal? Well, the big deal is this. There are other options that are there. You just have to be able to think about them. You have to be able to communicate. You have to be concerned about your own longevity. If you don't want to live like a prisoner, you have to use your mind, feed your mind, and come up with other alternatives to the situation. Mm. I was going to say not to give away anything, but but you did say this is after she gets out of prison, right? So Don't we understand that. I'm not, I'm not. <laughs> but this it's is after prison. Easy. This is her getting released, right? So I wanted yes. to ask you this. I remember a few years ago, you had done an interview where you said you don't really watch reality shows. Yes. And one of the things that um, Winter was on is, you know, she was planning to get out and do a reality show obviously, because she's celebrated, people knew her, she's flossy, she's dope, she's got style. So what are your thoughts on reality shows today? Is there anything that you do like? Well, here's the deal. I watched reality shows up until a point, but I just felt myself getting so sad about the state of, of our community and the state of our people on the shows. And I remember when they first, when the reality shows first debuted and I love reality and I write about reality. So I'm not, you know, just hating on the whole genre. It's nothing like that. I remember when uh, Flavor Flav, my homeboy, mm -hmm. <laughs> had Flavor of Love. And I remember men who are married and were married at the time thinking, wait a minute, hold up. <laughs> this guy got a house full of chicks. If he can do this, I should be able to do this too. And they all cool with it. And they all in the house together. And he takes some of them out sometimes or one of them out another time. And what, ha what happened was it's introduced as reality, but then it shifts what is the actual reality and what is the actual definition of things. So I think uh, from the beginning of the introduction of the reality shows, we've been very challenged about definitions to the point where young people don't even like definitions anymore. So if I say, okay, let's discuss manhood, let's discuss womanhood, we have to have a 24 hour debate about why <laughs> we should not say the word man and should not say the word woman. And that used to be something that happened uh, back in the day with identity. You know, black people would get together 
to organize something good and positive. And the whole meeting would go on for hours and hours and big argument about, should we call ourselves Africans? Should we call ourselves only African-Americans? No, we. some people were like, we should just call ourselves the Blacks. And then some people were like, no, we're the Negroes, we're the Negroids. <laughs> and because of all of the identity confusion and the fact that we can't even agree on the definitions, that means that we can't even communicate that's right. So if we don't if we don't know the definition of manhood or womanhood and we don't know the definition of marriage and we don't know the definition of husband and wife, that means that you could be marrying somebody who actually doesn't know what he or she is supposed to do. Mm. But where do we learn Not- this? Where do we learn this? And and that's that's part of the problem. Like you can't go to the barbershop and you have a conversation about what love is. I mean, you, you could talk about LeBron James at the barbershop, but, you know, right. you're having a conversation about, you know, what a man should do in a marriage well, you, or what, what love is or how to raise your child. Like, we don't have those conversations, per se. Right. And what our community has to look at is that in other communities, those are the things that make up their culture. Those are the things that they discuss in their culture. So in another community, for example, they might have a faith. And from the faith comes the rules. The rules establish the order and define how things should go. But in our community, we don't have a consensus about almost anything. And then even in the larger American community, we don't have a consensus because America pushes rugged individualism. Mm -hmm. That's why when COVID hit, the United States of America, there was a big argument. No, is it patriotic to put on a face mask? No, it's not patriotic. It's my right not to put it on. Uh, And then there's this big dialogue. As a result, so much time passed without Americans being able to agree on social distancing, on washing your hands and covering your hands and covering your face, whether or not it was un-American. So many things happened. Nobody could integrate into the conversation that this is about science. This is about a virus that happens a particular way. And if you don't adopt these protective procedures, we are at, we're going to have a collective emergency, even though we're a collection of rugged individuals. Oh, you, so, you know, yeah. to, to, to add on to what Envy said too, um, another reason that we, you know, it's hard for us to discuss love in our community is because of the examples we've seen, you know what I mean? Like, I like, yeah, my father loved my mother, but it, it was toxic. <laughs> you know what I'm saying? And it's like, we, we don't see too many good examples of, of healthy love and healthy relationships. Right. You're right. I mean, you're 100% right. And that goes for all of us, right? Because there's not this, this perfect family that exists somewhere, you know, Every family is going to experience different kind of things, but the fundamental things is what is causing the crisis in the community of the African American people. Where do we go to learn it? I don't know uh, because I feel like, as one of the people in uh, hip hop who dedicated myself to study, who you know went to college and graduated, who loves books more than you know any other material thing, I. I didn't feel even the love in hip hop, the welcome in hip hop that I think I should have felt. I'm, I was there to be from, from young age, I was there to be helpful. That was always my agenda. Save the children, save the mothers, save the fathers, right. you know, let's build camps, let's build schools, let's re, relearn the things that we should know in order to keep our community cohesive and in order to survive. And that conversation led to my being an outsider because people, uh, quite frankly, didn't want to hear it, didn't want to change, didn't want to strive. And as a result, it went on for so long that we haven't corrected ourselves. 
Now we have a young generation who doesn't like criticism. Okay, so you don't like judgment. You don't want to study. <laughs> you don't like anything historical because you think it's old. Mm -hmm. And you don't like criticism. How will you become a better person day by day? Oof. What, how will you learn? And then you Everybody's have oversensitive. You know, you can't, we used to look, we used to, in, 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 the, in my projects, you used to be able to talk rough and strong. Nobody cried, right. nobody cried, because everybody spoke that way, mm -hmm. you know? And it was, nobody, nobody said, listen, I'm, I'm feeling really uncomfortable right now. <laughs> and, it's the truth. And you know, nobody's mother lost their job because she said her opinion and her opinion was a little rough. You know, nobody got banned from anything uh, because they th their culture taught them a particular way. We used to get beatings when we were young, we, but we got beatings when we did something wrong. And most of the time, believe it or not, we knew we deserved it. And once we got that beating, <laughs> we learned our lesson and we tried our best not to do that again. Now there's no distinction between discipline and abuse all discipline is considered abuse that's right so now we have a whole generation of undisciplined young people mm. what, what do you think about the can the cancel culture part where you almost can't learn you can't do anything wrong because it stays with you but it's almost like you're not allowed to make a mistake you're not allowed to grow you're not allowed to evolve yeah, actually, some of the people that keep using this word toxic are the most toxic. All right. So when I was young, I used to uh, uh, be a part of the American Legion. And the American Legion used to have this contest uh, on the United States Constitution. And how the contest worked was you study the United States Constitution and you study all the amendments and you go before a group of people, uh, scholars from the American Legion, and they throw out a case. They tell you a case, they cite it, and then you have to, based on your knowledge of the United States Constitution, you have to respond uh, intelligently and tell how you think the case should be decided. And, and now when this is going on, I'm a high school student. I'm like maybe 15 years old, so I'm studying the Constitution, and I'm in the contest. Really, I'm in the contest because there's huge scholarship money <laughs> and I'm from a poor family. So I'm like, yo, let's go get it. <laughs> so I studied the constitution. The problem is that now years later, all of the things that I learned seem like everybody thinks they are irrelevant now. Free speech was part of the constitution, but now it's not free speech. It's politically correct speech or make me feel comfortable speech. And if you don't, I'm gonna threaten your financial existence and right. cancel you and your whole family. Right. That's not, that's not free speech. Mm -hmm. And we were taught when we studied the Constitution of the United States of America, that your free speech goes up to the limit of you yelling fire in a crowded movie theater. Meaning you can speak freely as long as you are not setting off a chaotic, uh, illegal situation. And so that was the limit. But now that's not it. It could just be uh, some simple thing you said or some simple thing you read that you spoke about or, you know, you said how you felt about the vaccine or you said about mm -hmm. <laughs> whatever, how you feel about anything. And you can have your whole career ruined because of it. That's right. I, I want to go back to the book for a second. You got Nia Long. To, to be the voice of winner for the for the audio book. Did you pick it yourself or did you have auditions yeah. or what? <laughs> I picked Nia because the book company sent me 15 names of people who could read the audio version of Life After Death. And I'm an audio book fan, so I buy audio books. So I know off the top, as soon as I hear the voice, if the voice is not right for me, I shut the book off. I don't even care about the story if the voice is 
not write on the audio book. So they sent me 15 names and some of the people on the list that they gave had won Grammys and all kinds of awards and accolades. And I was like, but for the coldest winner ever, this list is irrelevant. It has to be somebody that the hood loves. That's right. It has, it has to be somebody that the hood loves. It has to be somebody that the men and the women love. Somebody whose voice is soothing and sultry. Somebody who's considered beautiful. Somebody who's considered soft enough and cool enough. You know, not a pushover, but you know, still sweet. Knee along to me fit that description. And I asked when I asked my biological sisters, um, you know, I was thinking of different names. When I said knee along, they everybody agreed. <laughs> And if you can get all the women in the house to agree mm -hmm. on on another woman, <laughs> that's the one you go with. So Nia Long, I thought I thought she was a beautiful choice for to read the audio version. That is that's amazing. I will say though, Sister Sosa, you do have that sultry voice also. Yeah, thank you very <laughs> much. But you know what? I knew that I would not be the voice reading the coldest one to ever or life after death, my new novel because I want to keep my voice, the sister soldier voice distinct from the Winter Santiago voice. I don't think those two voices can really mix. And not only that, when I think of anything for winter, I think what would winter want? Winter wouldn't want me reading her story. She knows what she wants. <laughs> she knows what she wants. And she would be like, you know, she would approve of Mia but she wouldn't approve of, of other folks. So I'm happy that Mia agreed. You know, Do you listen to any of the women in hip hop today? Like, are there any of these artists that are out now that you're like, okay, I like, you know, City Girls or Megan Thee Stallion? Well, I have nieces. My sisters all have daughters, a lot of daughters. And um, because I have nieces, that is what introduces me to the young women of hip hop. So I I like, um, I know y'all not gonna believe this, but I like Young M.A. Young M.A., like, okay. Yeah, I like her. Um, who would Winter like? Who would Winter like? <laughs> <laughs> Probably Cardi B. Okay. <laughs> Cardi yeah. I, I, yeah think, Cardi I think you would really like Rhapsody, Sister Soldier. Rhapsody, okay, yeah, so she, she I'll have to check. I'll have to check yeah, it I think out. You'll like um, City too. Yeah, yeah you would. Now nah, she's from North Carolina. I think you would really, really, really dig in. She's a she's a huge, huge fan of um the coldest one ever. True, oh, is that right? Yeah. True lyricist. Okay. True yeah, lyricist. I, mean, I think she's the best rapper out. Period. True lyricist. She gets busy. Well, you know what? Um, to be fair, I have been just living in a world of literature for the past maybe four years. And so uh, I don't know the full range of, of everybody. And my nieces mm -hmm. are not little sister soldiers. <laughs> so they listen, <laughs> to, they listen to the mainstream. Gotcha. You know, my niece, my niece Deja, she's listening to Cardi B, SZA, um, um, Young and May. She's listening. Everybody that's in the mainstream, that's who she's listening to. Do they know so that's who I find out about. Do they know who her aunt is? Do they know her, how, how big her aunt is and what have her, her aunt has done to for our culture? Do they know? My nieces, well, my nieces and I are very close. They make me feel like uh, I don't miss the fact that I don't have a daughter and that I have a son. Mm. Uh, and the reason why is because they, we, you know, all of my travels across the country and across the world, usually my nieces come with me mm. and, uh, and they're very challenging to me because they don't listen to anything that I say. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. So they're like the public, you know, mm -hmm. uh, they're very challenging to me. But by being in contact with them all of the time, I'm able to feel the pulse of the young generation and know what's going on. Uh, with everything. I mean, I can turn on YouTube, true, but it's a little different when you have the young people that are interacting. Right. You know, like, for example, in Jersey, my niece will be like, oh, you know, I know Diddy's, I, I know Diddy's sons. 
<laughs> she'll be like, you know, I know this person and I know that person. So she knows the generation under my generation. She knows everybody's children and I know all their mothers and fathers. So, gotcha. you know, it, it kind of flows <laughs> together. Hey, that's funny because, you know, in the hood, you'd be like, you such and such son, you Diddy son. You Sean, son? <laughs> yeah, exactly. Exactly. You know, I, I yep. know you, you, uh, your, your fictional stuff is so great. You know, Coldest One Ever, the sequel that's out right now, Life After Death, Midnight. But you did write a memoir in 94, No Disrespect. I don't know what you would call it now, but, you know, you're, 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 you're grown, a lot more years. Have you ever mm. thought about pinning something like that again? Yes. The memoir is not my autobiography. So I want to write the autobiography of Sister Soldier. Mm. I think it's important for people that are in the public eye to write their autobiographies, including all of you, you know, Charlemagne, Angela Yee, and me. Write your autobiography because after, after you are no longer here, all kinds of people will come saying all kinds of things that are not true, and you can't dispute it. You can't debate it. And if you haven't left a matter of record of your life, uh, then you cannot be uh, mem uh, memorialized properly or remembered properly. And, you know, look at all the documentaries that come out after a person's gone, mm -hmm. whether it's Michael Jackson or Prince or whoever it is. And then people are making all kinds of allegations and the person can't even defend themselves. So it's a little bit foul play, I think. So yeah, I'll write the autobiography of Sister Soldier, God willing, you know, within the next couple of years. That's one of the reasons I love Cicely Tyson's book, because if it really feel like Michael Jordan's last shot with the jazz, like, cause you know, she literally, mm -hmm. they've, they've been asking her to do her memoir for years. She never did it and she de does it. And in the last chapter, she talks about God's not gonna take her away until her work is done. And then she passes mm -hmm. two days after her memoir is released. Wow. Uh, yeah, two, yeah her, her memoir is fantastic too. Yeah, I, I'm gonna pick it up. I remember Cicely from when I was young. I remember that old movie called Sounder, you know, and mm -hmm. she was in there. Mm -hmm. I remember her. Sounder the dog, yeah. Yeah, she was in there with her pretty black. I read that book. <laughs> And she made me feel good about myself. And that's so mm -hmm. important, you know? How has your writing process changed from your first novel until now? How has it changed? Mm. I don't think it's changed. Uh, my writing process involves, first uh, happens inside of my mind. Uh, I think of a story like the same way I told you how I put together the POTUS whenever I think of a story and I'm, wa I'm walking around every day doing, doing ordinary things. And then I start uh, jotting down notes on stray pieces of paper or in my notebook, notes, notes, notes. And then I may start uh, gathering books or resources if it's the type of novel that needs some research. Like, for example, I, if I'm delving into other cultures, I'll need to know something about their language or whatever. I may sign up for a course and actually study that language uh, like I did for Japanese. And uh, I may actually travel to the country like I did for Japan, Korea and China, all of those different places. Since I was writing, I went to that region so that I could write authentically and so that, I, you know, I wasn't just repeating the same stereotypes about people. Uh, so my process goes, starts in the mind, well, starts in the soul, goes to the mind, goes to the imagination. Then I start taking notes. Then I do some research. Then I start writing in longhand in notebooks, the whole story in pen. Wow. And then after it's written, I usually give it to my nieces and they type it for me. <laughs> wow that's amazing well, those books are going to be like memorialized the actual long hand written because that's something that Hell yeah. i don't know if a lot of people do that okay. yeah i have i have storage full of notebooks and books thousands and thousands wow. of books well, make sure you pick up this book right here. That's right. Life After Death, the sequel to Coldest Winter Ever. Sister Soldier, you are a treasure, man. You know, we, uh, we, we, you know, during Black History Month, we honor different Black History Month legends, and we, we, we honored you uh, last month. So we really do wow. appreciate you, you and all your contributions to the culture. Absolutely. 
Well, I want to say, Charlemagne, I, I, I like your, um, your self-correction. Uh, I've seen your growth and, and, and I'm very happy. Uh, thank you so much. Thank you. <laughs> thank, thank you. Because so when we're young, we are, <laughs> we are something else. We are something else. That's you right. Know, all of so us thank you so much. Ability to get wiser. Thank you. Thank you. You so know, much. I'm so excited for this book. I've been waiting for this for decades. <laughs> so I'm really happy it's here. So for everybody, make sure you pick it up. Life after death. Mm -hmm. That means you got to go back because I had to go back to the coldest winter ever and do a reread and I had to revisit midnight. And so it's just exciting to me. And I just want to say thank you so much for putting this out, for coming on The Breakfast Club to promote. I know you haven't really been doing Zooms like that. So it is an honor. All thank right. you so much. And in stores now. Thank you so much. Sister Soldier, it's The Breakfast Club. Good morning. Thank you. Thank you.